Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. My name is David Campbell. I'm with the World Press Photo Foundation, and this panel is uh, part of our uh, collaboration with uh, Human Rights Watch for this weekend. Uh, and we're here to talk about visual storytelling and human rights, and in particular, try to recast some of the debate or pose the debate in a slightly different way uh, with the idea that uh, to ask the question why we need more than one photograph uh, to change the world. We've invited a series of photojournalists, visual storytellers, who have both uh, worked uh, with Human Rights Watch on human rights or on human rights issues uh, and have connections with World Press Photo to investigate uh, these questions. And I would just uh, like to introduce the three of them to you. And then the format is that uh, each of them will have 15 minutes just to show some images uh, relating to a particular project that they've been engaged in and focus uh, on the purpose of the project, the aim of the project, and in particular how they approach the question of impact uh, with the project. Uh, and this, I think, is also part of the kind of reframing and recasting uh, of the issue is to ask these questions. Um, I think everyone is obviously coming out of the photography world, understands that the image is incredibly important, but the image by itself cannot do the work that is required of it in relationship to these issues. And we're going to be looking at how other things are brought into conjunction with the image uh, to tell broader stories, connect with communities, uh, and promote the issue. So it's a great pleasure to have these three people with us. On my left is and who will be presenting first is Anastasia Taylor-Lind. Anastasia is a freelance photojournalist who's been working for editorial publications uh, for uh, all over the world on issues relating to women, population and war for the last 15 years. Uh, she is also a 2016 Harvard Nieman Fellow and recently finished a year of uh, research at the university there on war and how we tell stories about modern conflict. Marcus Bleasdale is a photojournalist who's collaborated with Human Rights Watch for 20 years or more, I think. He's been dedicated to covering a series of underreported issues uh, and has been really, I think, at the heart of Human Rights Watch's interest in using visuals in creative ways to tell stories and deliver information uh, so it has more impact. And finally, Tara todras Whitel is a photojournalist living in Istanbul. She's the co-founder of Vignette Interactive, which is an innovative storytelling company. And she's been documenting uh, women-related issues, and she'll be talking about one of those projects uh, tonight. So Anastasia, take Thank it away. You. Oh, um, may I have the clicker first? Thank you. Uh, I recently um, was commissioned by Human Rights Watch to travel to Bangladesh, the Bangladeshi-Burma uh, border, and uh, document the Rohingya crisis there, together with a team of um, human rights uh, researchers. And um, I guess I should start by saying my apologies to those of you who attended the session earlier, um, specifically on the Rohingya crisis, um, where I also spoke about this work. But hopefully the context um, of those pictures and the discussions that we'll have afterwards um, w will be different. But um, to bring everybody else up to speed, I'm just going to talk you through that work um, a little bit. So. Um, I was assigned in September to go to Bangladesh and spend a month there together with a team of, uh, in the end, about um, 10 to 12 people who were collecting eyewitness testimonies of Rohingya who had fled the um, violence in Burma. And um, the, res the Human Rights Watch researchers were um, uh, all had a background in law, and so we're collecting very, very detailed um, individual testimonies. And I was assigned by um, Peter Bookhart, who's the Director of Emergencies at Human Rights Watch. Um, and I pretty much had a free creative brief. He just said, go and do what you do. And so um, I ended up photographing in a variety of different ways, uh, using a film panoramic camera and medium format portraits. Um, and traditional, more traditional reportage. Um, but what I'm going to share with you today is a series of portraits that accompany 
uh, those eyewitness accounts. Um, and I'm just going to speak you, uh, talk you through um, some excerpts from the uh, Human Rights Watch report that accompany these pictures. Uh, this is Mohammed Ayaz. He's 16 years old. Uh, and he saved his life by swimming across the river when the shooting started at the massacre that took place in Tula Tolly in August last year. Uh, he was wounded while running toward the river, but two men helped him cross and make it to the other side. He witnessed the killing of his entire family, his mother Janu, 45, his brothers Mohammed Yanis, 19, and Mohammed Tufail, 10, and his sisters Rajija, 14, and Hasina, 11. I saw them kill my mothers and sisters, he said. They were hit with sticks and cut with machetes and killed. After this, I saw them kill my brothers with machetes. It was a very inhuman thing. This is Rajuma. She was also a massacre survivor from Tula Tolly. Uh, Rajuma Begum said that soldiers took her from the group of women standing in the water to a three-room bamboo house nearby together with her mother-in-law and infant son, she said. In our group, we were three women with children, one young girl and an older woman. Between seven and 10 soldiers took us to a room in a house. There, there were other women in other rooms in the house. As we could hear them, I could hear women and girls screaming from the other rooms. She said they grabbed her 16-month-old toddler, Mohammed Sadik. They first took my child and threw him on the ground. He was still alive then, and I had to watch as they slaughtered him. The children of the other two women were killed the same way, thrown to the ground and killed with machetes. They were both boys, about five and seven. A few minutes later, they took the bodies of the children and threw them on a fa fire outside. Um. This series of portraits exists in the Human Rights Watch archive and um, is presented together with another set of images, um, which are uh, satellite, commercial satellite images that have been commissioned by um, Josh Lyons, a satellite imagery analyst at Human Rights Watch. And essentially, um, although very different on scale, um, Josh and I faced the same problem um, when we were trying to visualize what was happening in Rakhine State, and that is that we couldn't see any of the violence that it was our job to document or visualize. Um, so um, this is actually an, uh, uh, an excerpt from um, one long uh, piece of satellite imagery that Josh commissioned um, last summer when um, the Burmese army were uh, burning Rohingya villages to the ground. In total, he documented 342 villages that were burnt to the ground um, using these digital imaging techniques. And basically, um, the commercial satellite that Josh tasks uh, to collect these images flies south to north um, over Rakhine State orbits the Earth south to north, and as it moves, um, the camera pans from left to right and creates a series of images um, that are roughly 15 or 20 kilometers wide, so in this case, but infinitely long, one mega image, if you like. And um, when the majority of the violence took place against the Rohingya in Rakhine State last summer, um, it was at the height of the monsoon season, so um, cloud cover prevented Josh from seeing um, really any evidence of what was what was happening there, even from space. Uh, mostly he's using um, environmental satellite. Um, uh, he's using, he's commissioning um, imagery from companies who are uh, deploying satellites for environmental reasons to detect for forest fires, for example. And the in, in, and the in, in the instance of um, this kind of ethnic cleansing, um, it was that that initially um, allowed him to know that something was happening, um, although he couldn't see it. So this is an example of a, of a photograph where there is a break in the cloud cover. Um, 
you can see there is still some low-lying cloud, and each um, square represents a building that has been raised to the ground. Um, Josh estimated that between 95 and 99% of the images that he tasks over, tasked over Rakhine State were obscured by heavy monsoon cloud cover. So that meant that um, he couldn't see anything either, except that the fires from these villages um, sometimes burnt uh, a, a slight difference in the pixels uh, of the photograph that basically meant when he, um, oh, <laughs> beyond me as a photojournalist, technically, but there are a lot of similarities despite the seemingly different um, process in, in essentially what we're trying to um, illustrate. Illustrate seems like an inadequate word as well, doesn't it? Um, but the heat from those fires um, affected the pixels in those photographs. So even though he couldn't actually see the villages, once he overlaid those photographs of the cloud cover over maps of Rakhine State, he was able to identify where fires were taking place um, and eventually continued commissioning imagery um, that allowed for breaks in cloud cover to show, to show this destruction. So these photographs are often presented together, not only in this context, but in, uh, when Human Rights Watch present the work. And also, we used these pictures when we were in um, Kutupalong camp um, to uh, corroborate the evidence that we were collecting uh, from eyewitness testimonies um, and the people that I was photographing to accompany them. This is Rashida. I'm going to tell you a little bit what she told our researchers. She's 25. Um, she was also among hundreds of women um, who were forced to stand in the water at the edge of Tula Tolly village with their children. So I, I quote from her testimony. The women and their children were made to sit in the water. We women and children were more than 400 in the water. They took us away in groups of five women, five at a time, and there were more than 200 taken away by the time they took me. About half of the women and children remained in the water when they took me away. I don't know what happened to them. They brought five of us to a room in a house. They tortured us with knives and rifle butts. I had my 28-day-old baby, Mohammed Ekan, on my chest, and when they hit me, the baby fell. They hit the baby, and later I found he was dead. They hit me in the neck and they cut my throat with a knife and then stabbed me in the stomach. The other four girls died in the room. They burned the room and they couldn't escape. When the fire started, I woke up and found my baby with his head swollen and he was no more. This is Karima Khatun. She's a Chopran massacre survivor. We've documented over a course of a month um, four um, fairly major massacres as well as um, some other smaller <laughs> events. I realize how ridiculous it says saying that. Um, like the other women I photographed, Karima's two and a half year old son, um, Mohammed Anas was also killed in the attack. Um, he was initially wounded when an RPG landed in their courtyard. Uh, Mom, I have burning on my face, uh, he said, as she ran with him in her arms to a nearby paddy field to escape the attack by the Burmese army, by uniformed Burmese army. Um, there, Mohammed and Karima were struck by the same bullet uh, that tore through Mohammed's abdomen and into Karima's arm. She tried to bandage his torso with a scarf, but Mohammed died as she held him. Karima lost eight family members that day, her infant son, her husband, and her brother. This is the yeah, bullet wound. Um, thanks, Anastasia. I mean, I those testimonies are pretty horrific, and uh, maybe it's also a testament to like how important 
being a witness is taking those stories word by word, those testaments word by word. It's so important. Um, I, I'd like to talk about um, some work that I did in, in Central African Republic uh, t together with um, a Human Rights Watch. Uh, again, Peter Bukart, the Director of Emergencies. Uh, and um, I, I've worked in this region in Central African Republic and also Central Africa since about 1998. So I've been documenting the Central African Republic and its political instability and the reasons behind that political instability for for some time. But in 2012, the, um, the, there was an explosion of violence brought about by uh, a, a rebel group called the Seleka uh, in local Sango language that is kind of called coalition, a coalition of members that were brought together from various uh, ethnic and national backgrounds. Uh, so the, the Seleka, when we read about it in the press, sometimes people call it uh, a Muslim coalition, but actually it was, it was, a, it was a mix of Muslims, Christians, and uh, animist fighters that were from Central African Republic, Chad, South Sudan, and Sudan proper. And so, um, if we kind of envisage uh, a collection of vehicles that were coming towards the central uh, political space in Central African Republic, Bongi, uh, with these individuals on board. Some of those individuals had deep um, frustrations and, and, um, uh, and grievances that, that came from their own experiences with the, with the government of Central African Republic. Others were there because they were hoping to get paid. They were hoping that this was going to be a way of earning money for them. They were hoping that this was going to be a, a way that they could change the lives of their families. And sometimes rebel movements, it's that basic. And we look and we judge in our room in our little Western world, in our little Western city, and we make judgments about the people that are holding these Kalashnikovs and making these decisions and overthrowing these governments. But sometimes it it's a little bit more complex than that. And so Peter and I started documenting the conflict in Central African Republic in 2013, and I, and I only finished documenting it in 2017. So, uh, so 2013 to 2017, we took four and plus years on this particular crisis, and that doesn't mean to say that this particular crisis is over, it isn't actually, it's just transformed into something else. And so we can talk and touch on that a little bit at the end of the presentation, and maybe also in the questions. Um, but to give it some historical context, uh, the Central African Republic at the time was ruled um, by uh, a president that was pretty brutal, uh, pretty, um, harsh and had actually come to power in a pretty brutal way too and had treated uh, the people that helped him come to power um, uh, pretty poorly. So he was instilled in, in the presidency and um, President Bozezi, uh, as he was called then, uh, he took control but he, all the people that brought him to power, all the people that that helped him and fought for him at the time, this was back in 2004, uh, they uh, were treated appallingly by him and actually exiled, ostracized, imprisoned, killed, uh, their families taken over, their wealth was, uh, was, was basically um, taken from them. And, and that created this huge grievance that was essentially um, uh, it, it became almost uh, dormant within the country and within different prisons where these people who Bozezi had used to take power were then imprisoned. They were imprisoned in Chad, in Benin, in Sudan, in farthest places, Somalia, 
and uh, in, in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and, and Bozezi basically used his power to imprison all of these people that, that allowed him to take power. Now, of course, this hatred and this, this, uh, th this grievance built up over the years, and uh, it overflowed in 2013 or 2012, 2013, and these people started to take power. But it, it becomes more complex than that, and I think it's really important for, for us to understand at Human Rights Watch, we don't kind of look at the... We, we often read in the, in the press about conflicts like this, and it's distilled into 800 words or 1,200 words. And the journalists are challenged by their editors to put this conflict in context in such a small frame. And it can't be. You, you can't do that. It's too complex. It's too nuanced. And what Human Rights Watch is great at is pulling these things apart, spending time on it, and allowing us all, not just the general public, us, but also the policymakers and the people that are trying to find solutions for this, to put it into context and give us the real solutions. And, and so that's what people like Peter and many other researchers do. So this photograph that we see here um, is in a gold mine, and a SEMA it's called, and uh, it has a a monthly gold production of $250,000 a month and that money goes towards um, supplying the local groups who control this mine with uh, salaries to pay their soldiers as you see one of them in the image there and buy weaponry but it doesn't all go to them because they have obviously have to keep the local population happy because it's the local population that under this concept of bonded labor or slavery to give it another word are extracting these um, these uh, resources and so they tax between 25 and 50 percent of everything that they create from the mine and that money goes towards the Seleka and then later on so this image was taken in 2016 uh, and uh, and later this particular mine became the target for three different rebel groups. We then call, it gets a little complicated now, ex Seleka. once the Seleka lost power in 2014, they splintered into 14 different separate rebel groups. And those 14 different separate rebel groups started to fight for power to control the resources that would enable them a seat at a potential negotiating table at one year or two years or three years down the line and that seat at the table and their power at that seat at the table depend on how many resources they could access and how many guns they could control and so it's imperative for them to control places like this and that's what natural resource conflict is all about is controlling places like this so governments or individuals can become part of a peace process and have power at that peace process. Um, but how does that impact on the local population? Well, fighting for an environment like that mine creates instability and creates displacement. And so this image was shot in a town called Bosangoa, which is an area of gold and, uh, of, uh, gold and diamond deposits. And there were 30,000 people living in this one church. They were all displaced uh, and they were encircled by uh, the Seleka from time to time. Uh, and uh, it actually became, we were actually, Peter and I were, were in this town when it was attacked in December of 2013 by the local defense force that soon became known as the Anti-Balaka, the counter to the Seleka movement. Uh, and so this, this group of people who were in this church were attacked uh, at the same time by the Seleka. And, and, uh, and, uh, and on one day, on the 5th of December of 2013, Peter and I were in this town. We woke up after being subject to two days of attacks that a thousand people had been killed around this town. And um, it was a pretty shocking, pretty shocking experience. And what tends to happen a lot in this region is that um, these organizations, the warlords, the people that, are, that have a greater goal 
that could either be focused on their, their own personal enrichment or their own personal um, political enrichment. It doesn't necessarily have to be financial. Sometimes a political enrichment in the long term is more financially rewarding for a warlord than just going to a mine and hopefully controlling it for a matter of months. If you could take a political position in a place like Central African Republic, then that gives you access to streams of income that can far eclipse anything that you could make from a mine. And just to put that in context, in the northern parts of Central African Republic, there are oil deposits, and they are the same oil deposits that Chad, the neighboring country to the north, is exploiting. Uh, and so Chad has, one could say, I say, but one could say that Chad has an interest in destabilizing the Central African Republic so that it doesn't give the government of the Central African Republic the opportunity to exploit the oil which is on the southern border. They all sit in the same reservoir. So if the Central African Republic starts to take oil deposits, that depletes the oil deposits of Chad. So you can see how this becomes a regional conflict and how this context of we talked about all of these different ethnicities on those trucks as they traveled into the Central African Republic in 2013, how, how this regional conflict starts to play. And, and, and it doesn't, it's not a national issue. We talk about a civil war, but it isn't a civil war. It's, it's almost a regional war. We can't take this war in isolation. This isn't a war about Central African Republic. This is a war about the Central African Republic. It's a war about Chad. It's a war about South Sudan. It's a war about Sudan and Darfur. It's a war about regional hegemon. It's about who will control the major powers in the next 10 years. And so we think sometimes these individual conflicts are isolated, but they're not. And this image actually explains that a little bit because this child who is 14 who is fighting a war in the Central African Republic for an organization that is embedded in the Seleka is from Sudan. He's not from Central African Republic. He's brought in from the displaced camps in Darfur and he is now fighting this war in the Central African Republic. And these stories aren't isolated. They are, you see this time and time and time again. What happened was that the Seleka government started to fall apart. It started to be challenged by organizations like Human Rights Watch because we were creating, as, uh, as Anastasia showed you earlier on, we also had satellite imagery. We were also actually showing that satellite imagery to the perpetrators, to the Seleka, saying, we know what you have done. Peter actually took these maps and these photographs to the Seleka in a meeting in Bosangoa and said, we have proof of what you have done. It's here. Um, stop doing it and go back to your camps. And they actually, they did. They, they behaved and they went back to the camps because they saw the, the impact that those photographs and th that imagery could have on their security. Um, and and so over time, that, that organization of the Seleka started to disintegrate and disrupt as their opportunities to pay themselves started to erode. And that gave an opportunity, and, and that kind of culminated in the, the Michael Jutodia, who was the head of the Seleka movement, um, uh, was invited to a meeting in Chad and never returned. So that at that point, it was all over for the Seleka, and that was in uh, January 2014. And so you can imagine that the population of the Central African Republic that had been for 12 months submitted to such brutality by the Seleka movement rose up and tried to, ex ex tried to really express their anger and their frustration against the largely innocent Muslim population that was in the Central African Republic, who hadn't really, most of them hadn't been part of the Seleka movement. They had lived there for generations, they'd been intermarried, they were working together and trading together with the Christian and animist populations for generations. But this very angry and upset uh, and, and to, uh, later on politically motivated Christian and animist population f focused on the Muslims. And this image is a, is a citizen who is running through the burnt remains of a, a Muslim house 
in, an, in a Muslim quarter in the capital of Bongi. And this movement kind of led to the ethnic cleansing of 750,000 Muslims from the Central African Republic, many of whom haven't, haven't returned even now, and this was taken in 2014. Uh, and the people that did that, the people that rose up against them, w started as a local defense force, but then morphed into this organization called the Anti-Balaka, the Anti-Machete. And that's, this image is a, a representation of those individuals. And this image really is a, maybe a, a testament to hope. And we were talking about why you can't really tell a story with one photograph, you need many, but you don't just need photographs, you need stories, and you don't just need stories, you need policy makers and, and, and people who have power to change the issues on the ground so that you can change the way people are living. But this image, Eliam here, who has been introduced to his mother after being kidnapped, Peter and I actually discovered Eliam and his father on the side of a road about 250 kilometers north of Bungi when we were coming back from an investigation and they were lying almost you know exhausted at the side of the road they could hardly move and uh, they asked us if we could take them back to Bungi and once we were on in the car going back to Bungi they explained to us what had happened to them and when the Selica left Bungi fled Bungi um, they were kidnapped as baggage carriers and they were used to transport the Seleka's baggage for nine or ten days and they were forced to march you know hundreds 250 kilometers clearly because that's where we picked them up from uh, a few days later through the bush carrying this baggage and many of the people that were kidnapped with him were killed when they couldn't walk anymore they were just killed and they managed to survive and 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 when the Seleka group that they were with were attacked at night they managed they took that opportunity to escape and we found them and brought them back and we had this, and I, and I think that this is, there are a few occasions in my career, 20 years or so working with Human Rights Watch, that I've had this moment, but this is probably one of the moments of where you realize it's all things work. Uh, and there is a hope, because we had the opportunity to take Eliane back to his mother and witness this moment. It's very special for me. Can I just ask a question of both of you before, yeah. before Tara, because you've both talked about very specific projects that you did with Human Rights Watch. When you began those projects, did you think about, or do, consciously discuss who the audience was for the project? And, and, and if so, what, um, how did that discussion impact on how you photographed and visually told the story in each case? This was my first assignment for Human Rights Watch. And I didn't have any brief at all other than just come with us and, and um, see how you respond visually. And I didn't know what that was going to be before. Um, that might sound foolhardy or like poor planning, but actually in terms of telling a story as a photojournalist, that's probably the best place to start out from, I think. But um, you've had a lot more experience of working with these chaps than I have Marcus, I don't know. I think it, diff it changes, uh, and, and so we, we spent a long time documenting the conflict in Central African Republic and our audience changed throughout that time. So at the beginning we, we went, uh, probably with a similar brief to Anastasia when she was covering the Rohingya crisis, let's go and see and understand, mm -hmm. and try to see, let, let, let's go and visualize what's going on on the ground. But then uh, by the second trip, the, it was clear that there needed some level of intervention and there was a limited group of individuals or states that could intervene at that point. The level of violence was ex escalating, uh, the day-to-day the, the, the -day violence was uh, uh, very specific against certain populations and uh, targeting that message to the Americans wouldn't have achieved very much. Targeting that message to the British wouldn't have achieved that very, very much. But targeting that message to the Ministry of Defence in France could achieve an enormous amount because they were the 
ex colony who has had significant economic interests in the region, and they were the only or only state that had significant military capacity in the region. So it was the only place to spend to send messages to, and so not only did we, uh, as a visual creating visual imagery, we were focusing on telling testimony, but it was more about the distribution. Mm -hmm. And so we, we you know, we were using Twitter, we were using Instagram, we were using Facebook, but we were hashtagging France and Ministry of Defence, and and so we were including them in the conversation. And then you actually saw that on Twitter we were being followed by the Ministry of Defence in France, and we were being followed by, you know, the Foreign Ministry, and we were being followed by the the, the um, ambassador in Bangui. And at that point, you knew that you had an audience. And at that point, you knew that there was an opportunity for it to be quite impactful. Great. Thanks. Dar. Um, sorry. That's it. Okay. So um, my, um, this project is not um, specifically um, associated with Human Rights Watch, although obviously it's all about the impact. And um, just to give a little bit of background, um, I've been working at photojournalism in the re Middle East Africa region for over 10 years, and I moved to try to do more work on women's issues, and I kind of got sidetracked into doing a lot more news photography, which was good, but I didn't get to focus on the things that I was really passionate about. So um, at some point I was like needed to move back into that, and I quit uh, the Associated Press, and I started working as a freelancer again, and then I, um, I started my own company with my uh, co-founder and to do more impactful journalism because or impactful projects specifically for NGOs because we felt like the skills that we could bring as as journalists to organizations would be able to give them the like the things that we see and why we're attracted to stories to them so you know we know what, what's the nut of a story. We understand what's good for a larger audience and not necessarily NGOs know that or see that because they have so much and they're like, we need to put it all out there. And you're like, well, you need to draw people in first. So when we're working with our, you know, the, our clients and our projects, one of the first questions we always ask is, who's your audience? What's the impact that you want to make? And this was similar for, this is a grant that I got um, there uh, from the European Center for Journal Journalism Center, excuse me. And then you, the grant, like you have to specifically tell them what you're doing and how you want to make the impact. And, you know, so you are very targeted on that. And the idea of this is, um, this was about um, abortion access in Nepal, where um, it's, abortion is, um, is legalized, but still more than 50% of women get illegal abortions. And so with the creation of the, or the reinstatement of the Mexico City policy by uh, the U.S. Um, last year, there to show the impact on these places, not just on places that where abortion is illegal or what is happening, but like where abortion is legal and there are still a lot of issues. So to show how all this is going to be affected by this uh, reinstated policy. And um, for for me, in terms of women's issues, trying to make an impact, trying to figure this out, like they wanted us to figure out, like specifically they were looking to target, you know, um, they wanted us to look at Europe, which was for me perfect because in terms of abortion, uh, rights and and things like this, the people they are at, they, in terms of stepping up to the plate, in losing the money from the U.S., it, people are looking more towards Europe. So like trying to find that. So I, I approached Witness, um, the online magazine for World Press Photo, to publish um, a photo essay and article, and included in that, on part of the grant, was an interactive quiz, because it was for me and part of like integrating different technologies and that's we do a lot with that at, at vignette is um you know trying to find different ways to make impact through storytelling with the data with everything and so the interactive quiz which is embedded in the 
in the article is about what do you know about the Mexico City policy? Because it's a very complicated issue that not many people understand. So you can take the quiz, you can embed it yourself, you can download the data visualizations, you can use them for different things. So that was the point for that. Um, and just to go through these uh, pictures, I'm gonna use my phone because I have the uh, captions on it. So, um, so this is, um, when I got to Nepal, um, what I realized as an example for why there's so many people that, women that don't get legal abortions, dissemination of information is minimal. Like, I realized when I got there that um, abortion had been made free, all abortion and contraception services had been made free since the beginning of the year. I went in July, so it had been like seven months. Not one person I talked to knew that, not one, not a, like it was minimal in the actual clinics, um, but in the um, on like in the villages, not one woman knew it, and it was they had no idea. And when you go to the hospitals, it's written high in very small type. There's you know 60 percent illiteracy in a lot of these places for women. They can't read that. They have no idea, and no one's telling them. So, for example, this woman. Um, uh, Ramsha, I can't even say her name now. Um, Rush, Ramshaki uh, Dev, she was 32. Um, she had uh, four kids, and this she had gotten an abortion after getting pregnant for the fifth time. Um, she, her husband works inter like abroad. A lot of people go abroad to send money home, and her, he doesn't come home very often. So she wasn't on contraception when he came home, and she got pregnant. Um, she didn't have any idea that abortion was legal. Um, she had just been told by a family friend that she could go and get it, went to the pharmacy, got a pill and took it. No prescription, no follow-up. That's very typical. So, you know, there's a lot of um, contraband coming in from Inda India that are not necessarily, um, you know, being regula regulated by the government. So there's a lot of issues with that for women in terms of these things. Um, she was fine when she took the abortion. She didn't have any complications, but you know, this is like a very typical story in terms of that. Um, this woman, um, she didn't want to be identified. Her, um, she just wanted to go by N. And um, she was raped by her husband's friend after she was uh, married for a couple months but was still living at her family's home. And um, she got pregnant and she wanted to keep the baby, but her in-laws and her parents said that if she, because they didn't know if it was her husband's kid or if it was the guy who raped her, that they didn't want her to keep the child because they were like, what happens if your husband doesn't feel like he sees his face in it, then he'll never love you or him, the baby. So she had, um, she used homeopathic methods, which is, we don't know exactly if that was the reason, but she said she, her in-laws gave her papaya, only papaya for three days straight, which is seen as a homeopathic way to abort a baby. There's no, uh, scientific, um, there's there, the, the, there's nothing in the literature that says that that actually happens, but after three days she did, the baby either miscarried or she had, the baby was aborted. So um, this is her baby from her husband, and, um, and she still carries that weight because she wanted to keep the baby. And of course, she didn't, neither her nor her in-laws or her mother knew that abortion was legal. They didn't have any idea. They went to the doctor to find out that she was pregnant, but then they left immediately afterwards, not asking about any sort of, like how, um, how she could deal with it. So um, there's a lot of shame from her part because she didn't want to abort the child. She felt like it was killing her child and she had to do it. Um, and of course, no one else in the community, she you know, lives at her in-laws, she doesn't talk to anyone else, so there's no you know, it's very, very much a closed uh, society. So very little education about your rights. Um, this family uh, is, they had, uh, this is the, um, 
the father is a uh, Surenda Nayak, and he's sitting with three of his daughters. Um, and he had six daughters, and then they had a a, ch a, a, a baby, a boy. So then they started using contraception. And the reason that I included this in the photo essay and in terms of what I was doing is because it's not just about like the abortion aspect. It's about you know they they're still like this like needing to have one son and um, not really caring like or trying to do anything with contraception. So trying to show all the different types, parts of this 3D picture that goes into understanding, um, you know, reproductive rights on all levels in a country. It's like doesn't stop. There's no black and white. It's all very gray. So just kind of the scale of like someone who never used contraception because they wanted a son and didn't stop until they had a son and are very, very poor and live in a house that's like two rooms with their six daughters and one son. And, you know, that's what they that's what they intended until they had their son. But like no sort of movement to um, educate their daughters on anything with this and probably would go end up marrying off their eldest very soon. Um, this is a clinic in Kathmandu. In Kathmandu, it was a very different situation, Kathmandu being the capital of Nepal, about people understanding their rights. And it was literally a line out the door for women that were lining up to get an abortion at that, that they knew that it had been um, made free out the door. So it was like in the villages, no one knew. In Kathmandu, very much the opposite. And so, you know, the cities are a very different situation than the countryside. And, you know, no kind of shame either. Like just going and sitting in on these sessions, the women just didn't care if I was there, didn't care about it because it was something that they were going to do. And consequently, this couple, um, you know, they we asked obviously if we could photograph them. And in the other cases, like the one who didn't want her face, but also the other woman, they just didn't want their villages to know. Like they were comfortable with me taking their picture, but their immediate relatives, they didn't want them to know why we were there. So like, as long as they didn't know when that didn't get back to them, they were okay with it. This couple didn't care. Like they were like, we're here. She's ha we've had three kids. We can't afford a fourth. We're having an abortion. Please feel free to take a portrait. So it's like a very different situation in the capital versus um, anything else. So, so yeah, so then in terms of the impact, we're just going like it's a very long process in terms of like my, my hope, my plan for this project and going forward, I'm doing something similar this year in South Africa and Mozambique uh, with another grant is to use these photo and the media and the data visualizations to help um, the uh, organizations that are working on the ground to tell their stories or like in a higher level to help get to the politicians, the people that are making the decisions. So, you know, talking to organizations like She Decides uh, to help them maybe use this media or use any of the other things that I can going forward to create more of an impact and to work with them on that. So, you know, that's kind of the, the idea is it's beyond the photos, it's like using all the different pieces of the storytelling to get maximum impact. Great. Um, a question for all of you. you. I mean, you are reporting on situations that are very complex locally. They also have regional and global dimensions. Did you come across local storytellers from those environments themselves doing similar reporting to yourself, investigating those issues? And if so, what do you think is the different role, responsibility, and view of the local storyteller versus the international one coming in to tell the story? Um, in the case of uh, Rohingya reporting, I was working together with a videographer, Shoham Ek Ekram. And he, um, he is Bangladeshi. He traveled from Dhaka. But we were um, essentially working side by side. So. He was from the country that we were reporting in, and I, I obviously came from London. Um, we were tasked with the same job, and obviously the process was different because one was video and one was photography, but essentially we were part of the same team. So, yeah, we worked side by side for a month. Um, 
would, do you think there was any difference in kind of a, even though part of the same team, mm -hmm. any difference in approach between the two of you or we emphasizing did. different things or? Broadly speaking, no, right. but we did sometimes have some interesting conversations about, um, uh, Shohan would say I was very European in my approach. I'd be very kind of softly, softly in my way of interacting with people and quite sensitive about that. This is just a conversation we had when we were driving in the car. It's not like any empirical research or anything, but of course there were cultural differences because the two of us came from different cultures. So it was something that we talked about often um, where just the, I mean, I would find Shohan direct a little too direct perhaps sometimes, not too direct, and mm. he would find me a little bit too fluffy just in when we were ask, you know, mm. interacting with people. Um, but I think that's cult a, a difference in culture and also possibly in gender as mm. well. Um, uh, towards the end of my trip, we were joined by um, Akshaya and Sky, two human rights watch um, investigators, but uh, for the majority of my trip, I was the only woman. So I, th I think that that played into it also, and about half our team were Bangladeshi and yeah. half were foreigners. I don't know. If, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We. I think it's a little different because we were in a conflict situation, yeah. and so when you're in a conflict situation, there are certain rules and regulations about who you endanger. We were also in an ethnic conflict, and so when you're going into a region, you have to be very careful who you take there because you can endanger them because of their ethnicity. And so we have to be very aware of that. Uh, but that said, we traveled uh, a lot with researchers, mostly either local journalists and local human rights activists who provided local knowledge and, and at times translations um, about the situations that were going on. But then increasingly as the conflict matured, if you want to call it that, uh, you know, two or three years down the road, then um, I was, uh, what, what tends to happen a lot as well with photography, this, I started this journey with Human Rights Watch in 2013, and I finished it with National Geographic magazine in 2017. It's not to say that Human Rights Watch weren't still working on it, but the, the visual needs changed. And so uh, when I was working on the final story for National Geographic in 2016, 2017, then uh, I would work, it was more of a collaboration between local human rights journalists and me uh, about trying to find and understand the reasons behind the conflict. And, and, and they provided invaluable input, especially about individuals and their relationship to different actors and players and politicians, that, that they're very nuanced local knowledge that it's simply impossible mm -hmm. to know unless you spend time with someone and also get that local knowledge explained by someone who's also been there for a significant mm -hmm. period of time. And so it became a collaboration. But it's, it's very difficult, I think, at the beginning of a conflict, especially an ethnic one, that, that we can collaborate. Some mm -hmm. people can work there, some people can't. Mm -hmm. Some people can tell a percentage of the story, but you can't tell a balanced one. Sure. because you can't travel from one side to the other. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good question because, of course, like at least with the stuff that I do, we always work with local teams mm -hmm. because it's a really important aspect of understanding what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then, like, for this story and for the, the grant, um, I always um, I wanted to work with women journalists and ones that I could, you know, work with on stories that they could then produce afterwards and use in the local newspapers. And so in Nepal, this woman, Rojita, who's very in, works on a lot of women's rights issues there, she and I teamed up and her resources were amazing and, you know, wouldn't have gotten anywhere without her. And she's now going to take this stuff and work on it for the Nepali Times. And so that's always like something that, I mean, for me and, and for Vignette, we always want to make sure we have that kind of local presence because it's invaluable to understanding the stuff that we're doing. Cool. So we want to open up for, for questions, comments. Any questions from the audience? 
We have a microphone to circulate. Um, a question about the Central African Republic. So the French government had no idea what was happening up to the point in which you started sharing the story? Is that correct? Okay. No, they knew exactly what was happening. In fact, they were probably one of the instigators of it because they uh, were one of the providers, the main providers of security for Francois Bozesi. Uh, and they withdrew that support, which allowed him to be overthrown by the Seleka. So they, uh, for many years actually, uh, the French government have been both king makers and king removers in the Central African Republic. Uh, and nothing happens in the Central African Republic government without the French government approval. In fact, uh, up until quite recently, there was a French diplomat embedded in every ministry within the Central African Republic, <laughs> guiding and advising uh, within the significant ministries. So the French knew exactly what was going on. What they didn't know was the escalation of violence and how brutal it was in the outlying regions. They knew what it was like in Bongi, because there was a significant international press presence there. And the, of course, the, 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 the diplomats are there and the UN is there, but we were in the outlying regions and they didn't understand and, and realized that actually it had become a national movement. The uprising of the anti balaka on the 5th of December in 2014, was it 14, 13? Yeah, 2013. Um, they didn't quite get that that was a national movement, a national coordinated movement until the fact that we were there. And so it was the, it was the tweets and the Instagrams and the social media presence uh, from our organization and others that, that made them more aware. There's a question over there. Do you think that the <coughs> No, I think I, they have also some information on the ground, but they was uh, ignoring it because they don't want them to be in as long as their benefits. Yeah. Uh, their interest is uh, walking uh, correctly. I think that's a really interesting question because we were in the Central African Republic exactly 20 years after the Rwandan genocide, when the international community stood by and allowed 800,000 people to be massacred over a period of 90 days when people knew what was happening, largely. But the international community didn't know the extent of the massacre. They didn't know it was a genocide until afterwards. They didn't know how extensive it had been nationally until afterwards. And so we can see that maybe there are 5,000 people killed in a city or 1,000 people killed in a city, but we don't know that it's a national movement. And I think, I think what happened within the Central African Republic given that there was a six subsequent ethnic cleansing of almost 750,000 Muslims that, that were forced to leave the Central African Republic, what would have happened to them if there wasn't a military intervention by the French, if there wasn't an international response at that time? Knowing what I know and knowing how the killing happened and how quickly it escalated and how quickly it became out of control, we would have absolutely had maybe not 800,000, but a significant repeat of what we saw 20 years later when we said, never again. And so I think that what we don't necessarily celebrate sometimes is where intervention works. And I think in the Central African Republic, the case of the Central African Republic in 2013, intervention worked, not just Human Rights Watch, but Human Rights Watch, International Red Cross, Amnesty International, everybody was there and everybody was reporting and everybody was present and it was international because we were using social media. If Twitter and Instagram were available in 1994, I don't think we would have had a Rwandan genocide. But we had those tools this time and so it was an extraordinarily powerful thing to use. And so, you know, the inter intervention of the French government when would it have happened? It would have happened, but when would it have happened? That's the key. Would it have happened after 90 days? Or would it have happened on December the 9th, four days after 
the main intervention where everyone was massacred. That's the difference, I think. You're talking about... Well, I mean, now, nowadays, um, I went to Rwanda as well. I heard also, they say, not, you know, afterwards, in holiday life, but uh, it's still happening in other parts of the world. Mm. And now we do have all these, uh, the social media, but it's still not working and it's not getting... Yeah, there, there are complex international issues that, you know, Syria, for example, extraordinarily complex international issue. Darfur, that's a war that's still been going on. I started documenting Darfur in 2004, and they're still killing in Darfur. And so there are certain situations and certain conflicts and certain engagements that, that can be engaged through this, but others need much more nuanced and international responses where everyone, where the stakeholders have an interest in it concluding. And I'm not sure some of those conflicts, we have that. And, and Syria definitely is a case in point, I think. So it was a question in the back row. Oh, yeah. I actually had a question as well. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, looking at the different images that were displayed, I was wondering, uh, or I found that they appeared pretty different to me before knowing the story behind it and after getting to know the story behind it. Um, and obviously it's also a photographer's choice in a sense how to portray a certain situation so it, the photograph itself would be a subjective representation a subjective vis a visual representation um, so I was wondering to what extent do you believe shell pictures stand by themselves and to what extent can they be used for evidential well, for yeah for evidence The pictures I showed you um, only make sense with the testimonies that I read to you. If I had spent a month in Cox's Bazaar making a project about women who walked past the front door of my hotel room and photographed them against a black background, um, I could have lit them in the same way. Um, most pictures would have looked pretty similar, actually, um, but it's the the reason for taking the pictures, the meaning behind behind them, and that comes from the context that they are presented in, um, which is a, a very um, dense but actually also quite narrative report, um, which is on Human Rights Watch's website. You can download it there. Um, and, and in this instance, with me reading you short excerpts from that report, um, without any explanation they mean nothing. I think in rare instances, a fo photo just is by itself. And then mostly it has to have the context. And you have to have it in something that can create that so that people are not just flipping through and just see that, but they're going to spend the time to look at it and to read the captions and to be involved and to respond. And the question is how to get people to do that so that they feel connected. So in especially in like, you know, our ADD world that everyone can just go through things like this. How do you make people spend time and see that and understand that the story is behind it, which are incredibly important and need to have that context? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it, th there's a reason why Human Rights Watch like their documentary photographers to travel with their researchers, with their lawyers. They're not, most of them are lawyers, they're human rights lawyers. There is a process that these people have that's embedded in their methodology that um, means that what we're trying to do is to document the issues that Human Rights Watch and the lawyers on the ground feel are important to try to highlight the issues that they are trying to engage policymakers on. And so we can go into a village and we can say, you know, this is a lovely village and, and look at this farming, isn't it going on well? Or we could go into this village and say, yeah, but three or four days ago there was a massacre here. And that's an issue and, we're import and this, is, is, this is important for us to document. And there are two stories there. They're going on simultaneously. 
We choose the latter because that's why we're there. We're there to document the human rights abuses that were going on. And so we choose to point our camera to the left side of the road where the human rights abuse took place as opposed to the right side of the road where the farming is going on. And those are two different stories, and, but we represent one of them and that, because that's my job. And, uh, and, that, and that then goes on. That, the reason that we do that is because we will then have evidence to use in a court of law. We will then have evidence to take to a tribunal to show what happened when a perpetrator was engaged. And that collectively packaged together with satellite material or evidence gathered or testimony makes up a, a body of work that is irrefutable as evidence against someone who should be in jail. And that's why we're there. These aren't vacuous pictures. We're not just going to take pretty pictures. We're there for a reason. May I just add something to that? Um, just a very quick point. But, I, you know, uh, that's, I, I've worked editorially most of my life. So this is the first time that I've actually been making photographs for this purpose. And what you described is exactly the difference almost between photographing as a photographing for an editorial magazine and photographing for Human Rights Watch. The process is very different and um, the intention is also very different. It's not only narrative driven, if I may say. And narrative is important. The, the, to tell a story in an, a way that is engaging is also important, but the ultimate purpose of making pictures is different. So, yeah, I just learnt that. <laughs> Question over here. I think this engagement is, is crucial, and I'm wondering if one or more of you could say something about keeping a public engaged and, and fighting against the visual fatigue. You know, if we take a look at, at Syria, you know, I know it's it, it, incredibly complex. The entire world will be able to tell you about the photograph of a toddler on the beach or the video material of that traumatized child not saying anything or the chemical weapons victims. and. When do we talk about that now? It, it's kind of what well, we've moved on and now we've got the, the incredible imagery and, and stories of the Rohingya. How do you, in, in your roles, fight against that visual fatigue and keep a public engaged? It, particularly, you know, Marcus, your story about the Central African Republic when it wasn't even on the radar much to begin with. How, how does that actually figure in? Do you guys want to touch I, on that first? Or? May I? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, just as a, from a very different standpoint from Human Rights Watch, because I think there are very different ways to go about this. And, you know, I work a lot with uh, Vignette on the refugee crisis across Europe and in the Middle East. And we're constantly trying to find new ways to engage people that they don't have that visual fatigue anymore. Because what we're mainly really trying to do with a lot of people, a lot of the NGOs, is how do you still feel connected? And there are just too many, there's so many amazing, powerful, crazy pictures out there, videos, all this stuff, that it just is overload. So when we're working with an NGO, we look at all the different types that we can sort of immerse someone in. We look for a, we look for personal stories that will will really reach out to people. And we're always like what you say about like solution driven, trying to always like have something where people can feel that they can do something about it, so that it's not just oh my god that's so horrible and then next thing but what can you do next what can you personally get involved and so like how can you help this crisis how can you feel like you're connected and that kind of positive enforcement like people getting involved and doing that kind of thing is always something that we're striving for in very different contexts and and all the visual for storytelling not just photos not just video you know, interactive, all the other ways that we could really explore to do that. And it's a constant struggle. It's never ending. And every time it's like you have to pull in different things and figure out what the new thing is that you can try. Do you learn from that that some things are generally more effective or the effectiveness depends on the individual's story? 
It, I mean, if the, the story sings. Like, if you find that story that people connect to, that's what we're always looking for is the personal connection. I mean, that's like kind of the, like it's literally like you feel for that person and then how can you get that to a higher level? So that's always what we start from is how to make that part of a larger story. Um, but yeah, it just, it, I mean, sometimes we have to know who we're trying to reach and how to reach them. And maybe that's through animations, maybe that's through a website, depending on what kind of population we're trying to reach, like who has access to that. Maybe it's GIFs, mm -hmm. maybe it's WhatsApp messages, you know, it's like, who is the, your audience? Mm -hmm. And you have to know that in order to find that. But it's like, it's not so clear cut always. Mm -hmm. Just in respect to the Central African Republic, you were talking about. Um, I, I I think when when you're talking about fatigue, I kind of ask who's getting tired. Um, because there's a generational thing here, right? I, I think the first time I heard about fatigue was when I studied photography, and we were talking about the Vietnam War, and people started to get fatigue from the Vietnam War. But then we started to talk about other conflicts, and then we had the Iraq War, and then we had Iraq II, and then we had Congo, and then we had Syria, Central African Republic. And there is a process. But people are still impacted by what they see from a new crisis. They don't get fatigued because they've seen an image from Vietnam 30 years ago, and they're fatigued by that image, so they don't engage with what's happening in the Central African Republic. And so that, that's my first point. I, I think fatigue is a concept that maybe it's embedded in a particular conflict. But at that point, I ask, who are we trying to engage? And does it matter that the larger general population is, doesn't pay attention anymore? Because we're at the policy level now. And we, it's already on the front front page of a policy document at the UN or at a particular government issue or on a, on a particular peace negotiation deal. And that's the motivation for us to take the photograph in the first place, it was to get it at that level, to start to engage policymakers and to start to engage state actors to start to change things for people. And of course we need to maintain the story in the press, but at, at some point we have to hand it over to the policymakers. And that's where Human Rights Watch is great, because I'm still using work, and Human Rights Watch is still using work that I shot in 2004 for them on issues on natural resources and jewelry, so, you know, re r raw materials for jewelry. There was a, a report came out this week, I think it actually officially will be released on the 8th or something like that of February. But there's a film that, you know, there are, there are images that I shot in 2004 that are relevant to that. So there's no fatigue there. We're just reusing them and re-engaging a conversation that we should all still be aware of. That, you know, when you buy your gold or your diamonds or your rubies or whatever, think about where they come from. And that was a story I shot in the DRC in 2004 for a report for Human Rights Watch called The Curse of Gold. Although in certain cases in Vietnam, is one of them. I think in that context it's exactly right, and I, and I think to a certain extent uh, the Vietnam War is a really interesting uh, model to look at, and, and maybe it's a study to look at, it's just because you see to what extent does imagery work in the context of the Vietnam War, and to what extent does it fail, and, and to what extent is it fighting against the government structure that simply wouldn't allow it to change. No matter what, how many images that you created from the Vietnam War, there was an American structure that, didn't, that wouldn't change and it needed a tipping point. And that was a political tipping point, it wasn't a visual tipping point. And we have the similar situation in Syria. 
the Syrian situation isn't changing, not because we don't have enough effective imagery or the fact that people are fatigued by that imagery, but it's because as an international community, we got it wrong. And, and so the actors got the, they put together the wrong game. We were playing with the wrong chess maneuvers. You know, we had the wrong tactics. We supported the wrong person or we had the wrong end game envisaged at the beginning, which led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. And so it was the wrong political game that was played. And it wasn't because people got fatigued by an image. Well, first of all, thanks for sharing uh, stories about your work. Um, I was wondering, do you feel going into these different conflict situations, were you going into those situations as journalists or as activists? And could you elaborate a bit on that? And does that difference even exist in your mind at all? It's the first time you've done it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> slightly more complex question than it may appear to be. Um, I'm just going to think on it for a second because I'm not totally sure. I, I know you have, have I've read stuff that you've said on this and, and I really appreciate it. I'm just going to say briefly that working in both contexts, you know, you're, you're still guided by the same principles. You're just, if you're working for an NGO or you're working for a journalist organization, you're still using the ethics of journalism. Um, and for me personally, when we go for NGOs, we're guided by what they need as well, like vulnerabilities of populations. You can't do the same things as you might be able to do as a journalist because they need to make sure that they can continue their work depending on the organization in a country. I mean, Human Rights Watch is policy level, so they're not the same thing. But if you know, you're working with people that have government, you know, they're working with the government, you can't do certain things or you can't you know, um, you can't just um, show everything that's happening. You need to help them in the way they can be helped. So it's these kind of things um, for me, that's kind of always like the balance and you have to make sure that you are working within their context for that as well. But I, I, yeah, I think Human Rights Watch, again, it's a little bit different. Uh, but And the way I relate to it is a little bit different. But I started out as a photographer because I was an activist and I used photography as a tool to engage. So, uh, as I've said a few times before, uh, apologies, but I really don't like photography that much. <laughs> but I think it's a phenomenal tool. I think it's an incredibly powerful tool if you use it in the right way and then you engage the right people with it. And so, and I don't, and I think it's more powerful in some contexts than, than uh, 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 the pen, or more immediate at least in some circumstances. And, and I think that I can engage and, and, and empassion certain policymakers quicker with an image than I, than I could with a written word, or at least my written word. Uh, and so for me, I go to most of the environments that I work in as an activist, looking how I can engage policymakers, or with that context in mind, who is my audience here? Is it the consumer of a, of a, of a piece of jewelry? Is it the consumer of a mobile phone? Is it the manufacturer of the mobile phone? Is it the government who's allowing the mining to happen? Or is it the international community that could actually bring in a peace uh, mission to try to stem the violence in this particular region? And we go there with that question in mind and we target quite specifically, coldly, the audience that we want at that moment and that might change. But I think for me personally, I'm always an activist. But that, in the context of creating photographs, doesn't really alter the way I work with if I was working for National Geographic magazine. My method is the same and my rule book is the same and my ethics are the same. Probably a little higher, actually, if you're working with Human Rights Watch. I'm sorry, but you, you, know, you have lawyer level. This is going to go to the International Criminal Court. It has to be right. Uh, and so there's an, another level of scrutiny that underlies pretty much everything. And that's not undermining anything that's done on the journalism world. It's, that's also extraordinarily, you know, painstakingly researched. Uh, but if you're putting it onto the, into a court of law, 
then you have to you have to get it right. But that the, there is no massive difference between how I work with these two organisations, apart from who I'm targeting in my own mind and how I'm working with the lawyer I'm working with or how I'm working with a journalist from the New York, from the New York Times or from uh, National Geographic. That's the only nuanced difference, I think. Yeah, and I'm not sure if it was you or David who wrote it in one of the articles that I read, but I was struck by it's like you, obviously we all have points of view. Obviously we do, but we need to show the story in the way that it, you know, we have to give the journalists, the ethics of it are there. So whether you come to it from a journalist standpoint, NGO standpoint, activist standpoint, whatever it is, if you're, the, if the baseline is like telling the story and, you know, having a really high, like the standards are really high for that, then I think that you just have to acknowledge what it is, where you're coming from, and then be able to still provide the same results. That sounds really intelligent, so David probably wrote that. <laughs> I'm sure you did, actually. <laughs> I There's think, a hand over there, oh, may, may I just sure. jump in? Yeah, Sorry, I'm just trying to think of this through <laughs> as you're talking. Yeah, the process is the same, right? Because, you know, a journalistic process uh, um, of collecting, creating images on the ground, the process is the same. But I suppose the difference is that the pictures are being made to support an argument that is not, not, I don't want to use that word. So I suppose it's an issue of objectivity. I mean, if you could assume, or if you believe that journalism is absolutely objective and those journalists bring no biases to the story, then I would say this is different. But actually, um, I suppose even if we're reporting for a, a news outlet, our pictures are in the support of an argument, aren't they? Yeah. No, but I mean, there are different levels of journalism, right? So you can, you can look at the front page of the New York Times, which reports news, or you can go to page 10 and read the comment, and that's an editorial, and that has a point of view, and that's what I do, and that's what you did. And I also think the New York Times uh, front page doesn't necessarily have the aim to then influence uh, policymakers in France to change their problem, right? Mm. That's what you've been going into that conflict with a clear aim in mind, which is now obviously because you work for Human Rights Watch uh, uh, makes total sense. But I was just wondering in your in your entire career or on a personal level, do you feel that journalism, that your photojournalism might, you know, uh, be a bit of activism always? Like uh, more and more you're becoming campaigners or visual campaigners maybe instead of just storytellers, if that makes sense. I think you're, you're, you're looking from impact, and, yeah. and I think that's happening more and more, because yeah. I think people in the world are looking for impact more and more, not just like, I think it's, it's, it's evolved in terms of what people are looking for from their stories and what they want and you know, how they're connecting to them. So you know, obviously, you know, going and doing the stories in Nepal, I'm talking about women's reproductive rights. That has a very clear you know, focus, right? I'm, that's something I'm passionate about and I want people to know more about and to understand and what they take away from it. I hope that they understand more. I hope that that's the education. So the impact is, I think, personal in terms of what you're doing and knowing that, but like, you know, educating a larger population and understanding the impacts of these policies is, you know, something that I strive for. So that's where I come from and like, I think that, you know, I, I think you, if this, I think our, I think everything is like a different level than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. And, you know, I think that this is like a much, I think it's, I think there's some very positive aspects to like the craziness of the world and people wanting this now. I think that that's really one of the best things coming out of it. We talked a little bit about this before this started, and maybe we can come back to that a bit, but because we were just having a chat as you do about um, teaching and schools and how photographers learn their craft. And I, I, I've always been, I, I started my career with a view to engage in human rights. I didn't start my career with a view to take pretty pictures. Uh, and the pictures came after the human rights activist issue. 
So I've always had that part of my career. That's been what I, why I take photographs, always. But I think within schools, sometimes we, maybe more, more, more recently, and, and there's a geographical issue to this too sometimes, but like as young photographers come into this business, they maybe don't have that um, ethical motivation maybe that they did 25, 30 years ago. It seems that it's all about creating an image for themselves or creating an image of themselves or creating a place for themselves in this storytelling environment, which can be quite dangerous, I think, if it becomes about um, levitating your personal career over the issue. And, I, and, I, and then there's a bit of a graying of, I've seen quite, you know, over the last five years, because social media has allowed that space to take, you know, here's me, or here's an image I took, and this is my space and my story. And that t tends to erode the issue, the reason why you went there in the first place, if they even knew what that was in the beginning. I think that's quite a dangerous space, and I think schools teaching young photographers these days need to think a little bit about that. I think as institutions, and as, and as photographers, we need to talk a little bit more about that to try to guide the young photographers coming up that there are things that they need to be thinking about as opposed to their own career. We have time for three final questions. I've I was. I wanted to ask. Um, having worked uh, a substantial amount on um, human rights investigations in the context of Syria and Iraq. Chaps, this is Josh Lyons, Sorry. who creates the um, satellite imaging <laughs> well, for Human Rights Watch, and my photographic hero. <laughs> just been out of Josh. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to wow. say that. Um, many of the most evocative and powerful and compelling photographs from Syria and Iraq, in my mind, were taken by the perpetrators, mm. by the Syrian government, by ISIS, by other rebel forces, as they were committing atrocities. And essentially, these images are war criminal selfies. And we've always treated them in the context of, of you know, it's, it's part of this package of, of evidence that we have been compiling and, and collecting. And it certainly has an evidentiary value. But, but my, my question then is, is it possible for us to distinguish this evocative image that's documenting a crime based on the intent of the photographer in the act of documenting that crime. Because right now, there's this international clamor for censoring and suppressing ISIS-related photographs and videos. And at that superficial level, it's obvious. Of course, we need to suppress this material. But the material itself is, in my eye, indistinguishable from the most evocative images that you have taken and shared with the world. All of the Vietnam photos, you know, there's this, you know, um, a new discussion in the New York Times about the, the famous execution photograph. Mm -hmm. And that photograph could have been taken by ISIS, okay? And ISIS has taken photos that are nearly identical. And how do we distinguish it? What, my question is, is there a, a qualitative difference between two images of executions based on the intent of the photographer. Mm. Does that exist, or is that something that we're projecting onto the image? Can I, can I put that maybe question back to you? Question. Change, change the context of the conflict. And if we look at the Second World War, and we look at the images that were taken by the Russians, and the images that were taken by the Americans, do we look at those in a different context now? as we did then. If we look at the Im images of Vietnam, 
and the Viet Cong and the Americans? Do we look at those in a different context as we do now? We do then now we look at them in a context of documentary fashion. They're celebrated. They're taught this is history and we need to understand it. And it's important and it's valuable and we need to record it and get as much as we possibly can out of it. And I think in 25 years time, we might have the same view of the images and the films that were taken by ISIS. This is history and we can't take it away. Let's, set, let's, let's record it and archive it so that we learn for the next generation. That's, uh, That's a great answer. There were two more questions in here. Yes. I just want to go back to focusing and engage with you people. So um, rather than from the fatigue side, I was thinking more, um, you mentioned yourself that social media now allows us to post a lot of information about everything that's going on. Um, but can that not in itself become uh, destructive in the fact that I have to worry about Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Congo, everything that's happening? And um, do you not worry that people can be overwhelmed into an action? Into, and and that, if that's the case, how can you stop people becoming so overwhelmed that they just become, they, don't, they do nothing? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I wish I did. But I think about it a lot, that question, right? I mean, there's, and I don't think there's only one answer. Um, I think we can try and find unexpected ways to reach people in quite a personal way, actually. Um, social media allows us to um, access an audience directly um, instead of going through the traditional gatekeepers of the legacy media. Um, it also allows, um, it, it's d democratized photography in that um, we are not the only storytellers, um, uh, well, in general, but specifically uh, during news events. We can source pictures made by journalists, made by people who were affected by that incident, by the perpetrators of those crimes as well. Um, I think it involves innovative. Um, if we just take pictures, if we just take the same pictures, I mean, as photojournalists, if we just keep making the same pictures, the same... Tr I, I'm really struggling with this. I don't mean now, I mean in general. Like, because pictures are important, right? If we didn't have any pictures, the world would be a worse place. But at the same time, one picture isn't so important, right, that it can change anything. So I, I suppose it's a matter of scale. Um, if you could move someone, so advocacy, so, you know, at a policy level aside, just for a second. I really don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry, I'm going to give up halfway through. But yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? If you can touch people, and you can't with every story and with every picture. But like, if you keep trying. I'll try. So. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's the one thing that disproves my, my thesis about photography and the fact that I, I, I'm not that interested in it. In that I think if you take a, a compelling, attractive photograph that draws you in, that uses incredible light, that has emotion that you've never seen before, that has a situation that asks begs you to ask a question about it that, that's embedded in the skill of photography, that is embedded in, you know, all of the photographs that we remember from the Second World War and from Vietnam and from places. These individual images that have a certain context that draws in even still now, after we've seen them thousands of times, that's the skill of photography and that dis disproves my thesis in the fact that I'm not that interested in it. because. It's those skills and that factor that differentiates that conflict and those images from everything else that you see. And it will draw those people in to want to learn more and engage more and be passionate about stopping it, I think. And that, I think, is the strength of photography, is that if you can create something bizarrely beautiful out of something that's terrible, that you can start a conversation. I'd like to, the, and I think that's incredibly true, and, and I think that, like,
there are some times where you just see one image blow up, right? And that's just like everywhere and people are talking about it. And, you know, like Alan Kurt, the baby uh, that, you know, drowned and showed up on the um, shores of Turkey, like that went everywhere and people were talking about it and then it went away. And, you know, then it was something else the next week. And I think that's, that is part of the culture that we are a part of and there's no getting away from that. Um, so I think there will always be ones that are forgotten and then others that are up and down and it'll go up and down. But you're, I think as visual storytellers for us to continue with the, with the photography, with other ways to keep drawing people back in to remember the things that we're working that, you know, need to attention and that they can like do something about. I think that like I, I was thinking about things recently about like, how do you, um, how does something go viral? How does some one thing go viral versus another thing not? That's just as important as an image or a story and why does one fall flat and another one not? And so I've been kind of like looking at that as like a, a um, you know, more like, a higher level just trying to figure it out and you know one thing that at least from standpoint of like campaigns that again going back to the impact and a positive thing that people respond to like with the ice bucket challenge right mm -hmm. people throwing ice over their heads well the net second part of that was and donate so like it was something that engaged people even if it was stupid but everyone wanted to be a part of it so there was a community whether it was just a community of doing this really dumb act. And then they got more money than they had in the last like 20 years for, you know, that, it, like that kind of thing where it's like donate and, and that those connections I think are like how, I mean, that's not exactly anything to do with visual storytelling, but it's like, how do you make that connection? How do people feel engaged? And it's the same thing. And so we have to figure out new ways to go forward and do that. And you know, hopefully it's those amazing photos, but if it's not, what's the next thing we can do that will get people back in, that will feel like they can like, make a difference? I also think that sometimes when we talk about being overwhelmed or fatigued or whatever, we're making uh, the picture or the story an alibi for a decision that people have made not to pay attention in the first place. And that's the question of how people decide to pay attention, not what they're forced to do or led into doing by you know the power or not of the image and so on sometimes we don't face up to i think to the fact that people sometimes simply decide not to pay attention mm -hmm. right, and that's conscious because you actually can't pay attention to everything all, all at once anyway so that's one of the challenges i did the same thing you know when i go home i don't know what you guys watch when you sit yeah. there with your partner at home on the tv i can't watch a war movie no I can't watch anything that engages me in violence. I can't. I, I watch like cartoons or something, you know, with the kids. <laughs> anything that's more engaging than that, I, I simply can't do it because it touches something inside me that that that, that it, it 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 it's like someone stabbing me watching this stuff. I can't. I simply can't watch violence. And whilst it's part of my daily life, I filtered out that part of it. I don't want to see it. So I make a choice. I don't want to see that. And maybe that's the same reaction that other people have. I think we need to, to wrap up. Um, thank you very much for the questions. You can see photographs from Anastasia, Marcus, and Tara uh, throughout the cafe and upstairs in the building. And I want to thank my colleagues at World Press Photo, Josephine Higgins and Ivan Hisa, who worked hard to make tonight possible and to put that exhibition together. Um, you can download reports on uh, the work that Marcus and Anastasia have done from uh, hrw.org. You can read Tara's on Witness at witness.wallpressphoto.org. Thank you for coming and all the questions, and please thank our presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.